This is the second lecture for World War II um, about some of the impact on the home front and then about some of the military strategy. And we'll lead, we'll kind of end at the conferences towards the end of World War II um, and then leave it at the discussion about whether or not to, to drop the atomic bomb. So if you recall, um, Pearl Harbor, the attack in December 7th, 1941, the next day Roosevelt asked Congress for a declaration of war. We're in war, we mobilize, um, and one of the important things that AP will ask about is the impact on different groups of people. So first, one of the most notable impacts is on women, so the very famous image that you can see here of Rosie the Riveter, propaganda piece to get women to um, go take on men's jobs. A lot of the government efforts through this propaganda was to get married women in particular. So remember that in wartime, like in World War One, for example, Women have taken men's jobs in the past. Frequently it was targeted, though, at unmarried women. Married women were supposed to be at home taking care of the children. Daycare facilities weren't um, a thing at that time. So again, before it had been targeted at unmarried women, young unmarried women or poor married women were the only ones who were, quote-unquote, supposed to be working. Uh, during World War II, there was such a strong need that the government then starts focusing on married women. They still faced unequal pay situations, and then when the war came to an end, they were expected to go back home. And we'll see that um, because for three to four years, women had been working in men's jobs, like hard industrial jobs that they hadn't had before, like riveting, like welding, building these giant airplanes, tanks, etc., women finally felt like they, some women, um, felt like they had a sense of value and freedom, enjoyed making an income, and were um, not happy about being asked to either voluntarily quit and go back home um, or to be laid off. And so we see the kind of the beginnings of the feminist movement that we'll see rise in the 1960s. So that's the impact on women. The um, impact on Japanese Americans we'll be debating in class. Um, but if you recall, December 7th, Pearl Harbor happens uh, two and a half months later. President Roosevelt issues Executive Order 9066, and this was the order to place all Japanese Americans in internment camps. These were, excuse me, all Japanese Americans living on the West Coast, so Washington, Oregon, California, um, Japanese Americans in Texas, New York, etc., were, were not forced into these camps. It was about 117,000 Japanese Americans overall that were put into these camps. Um, ironically, Japanese Americans living in Hawaii were not forced into camps, even though that was the place that was attacked, um, and because they were kind of the primary workforce for the, the base there, Pearl Harbor, so like the cook staff, janitorial staff, etc. So um, again, it was just West Coast Japanese Americans, and we'll be debating that further in class. Uh, three big court cases where Japanese Americans sued. Again, these were citizens of America that were put into these camps, um, sued because it was a violation of their, their freedoms. Um, the biggest of those three cases that make it to the Supreme Court is Korematsu versus the United States. And the Supreme Court at the time rules that the internment camps were constitutional because, again, it was a time of war. So that'll be the court case that most likely is asked about on the AP exam. Um, another group impacted by this is African Americans. Uh, they begin what is known as the Double V for Victory campaign. And you can see the cartoon here uh, where he's uh, looking, he's got the list of Army, Navy, Defense, and then Jim Crow. So they were hoping for a two-pronged victory that was, one, a victory in the war. So if they enlisted, they'd serve, America would win. Um, one victory. Second victory is they hoped by serving patriotically, um, improving the image that mainstream white America had of them, that they would then finally gain civil rights and Jim Crow would be abolished. So again, that, that begins, unfortunately, when they do enlist, they face, just like in previous wars, unequal pay, they can't rise as high in the ranks for officerships, they live in segregated barracks and face general racism. Um, and then when they come home, Jim Crow is not impacted. And so we'll see kind of like the women, um, they had this hope that they were valued and they were valued during the war, but they, when they come home, they expect change and change does not happen. 
And so we'll see, like the feminist moving, mo movement rising up, we see a civil rights movement rising up in the 50s and um, more uh, kind of exponentially more active in the, in the 1960s. Last group, Native Americans, uh, they were valued because most of their languages were not written down and not well known and not easy to study. They're very complicated, some of the languages. And so they were used, Native Americans uh, who enlisted were used as what were known as wind talkers um, because the Nazis and Japanese could not understand or translate Native American languages. They were used um, to, again, communicate different orders because it was very hard for the enemy to translate. So again, they face, um, they find value, that they are valued for their service. When they come home, they still face many of the problems that have been facing Native Americans in the United States throughout history. And so we also see a Native American movement rising up in the 1950s and 60s. You'll see a, you see a trend here. Moving on to strategy. So again, this is, this is a two-theater war. So you've got the European theater, you've got the Pacific theater. The European strategy was known as the Hitler first strategy. So the U.S. wanted to focus on defeating Hitler and then um, move more of its efforts towards defeating Japan. And it was a three-pronged approach. So they were first going to move up um, from North Africa into Italy. You had the Soviet Union coming in from the east. And then the last prong of that approach was to come in through France, liberate France, and then move into Germany. So Operation Torch is the name for the operation to regain um, northern Africa and move into Italy, um, dealing with the threat from uh, the Italian Empire and, and Mussolini. Um, once that was mitigated, then become then the focus is on invading through France. So Operation Overlord was the name given to what we now know better as D-Day. Um, again, the focusing on the Normandy beaches that you can see here along the English Channel, um, a more detailed map here. Again, this was a joint effort between the US, the British, Canadian forces. And just one picture of the many spots along this beach just to kind of grasp the magnitude of this invasion. It's the largest amphibious assault that the US has ever launched to this day. And again, you can see here just the magnitude of that invasion. So that's in June of 1944. Uh, they then quickly roll into the rest of France. So in August 1945 is kind of known as the Battle for Paris, where they're trying to regain Paris. And by the end of August of 1945, they have liberated France. And then, like I, like I said earlier, it'll then be moving from France, liberating Belgium, Netherlands, moving into Germany. Um, as they move into Germany, um, and more so as uh, Russia is coming, coming in through the east, they start discovering the death camps. And so they were, we'll, and we'll talk about this in class with the Holocaust stations, um, that the U.S. was very well aware of what was going on with the concentration camps. There had been some reports about the final solution, the, the death camps and extermination um, policies towards the end of World War II. Some of them ignored. Many people just couldn't believe that it was that bad, and they thought these, these stories were just kind of propaganda. But um, as they move in, the Russians are reporting what they're finding, just these mass graves, the gas chambers. Uh, the U.S. is finding them as well, and Eisenhower, the, the main general in Europe, um, made sure that the units that were moving in were recording, filming, so that no one in the future could try to deny that the Holocaust had happen, happened. Um, so 1945, that was 1944. 1945, April 30th, the war is winding down and Hitler commits suicide. A week later, um, Germany has surrendered and the Allies accept that surrender on May 8th, uh, known as VE Day, so Victory in Europe Day. So there's Victory in Europe, and then later in the end of the summer, there'll be VJ Day, so Victory in Japan Day. So VE Day, end of um, the spring. We'll come back here in a moment to the Yalta and Potsdam conferences that are going on at the same time as kind of the Allied forces are moving into uh, Germany. Um, in the other theater, the Pacific Theater, 
Um, remember that Japan had been building their empire. They had moved into Manchuria, China, um, Southeast Asia, and many of the islands. Remember that they had taken the Philippines um, and many of the other little islands. And so the strategy there was to do allied hoppings, or excuse me, allied hopping, island hopping, was to slowly, literally hop, regain islands getting closer and closer to Japan. The last two that were the most important for kind of launching an invasion into Japan, one of the uh, final kind of end game strategies that was being considered were the islands of Iwo Jima and Okinawa. And those of you who are juniors, I believe you'll be going to the, the monument that memorializes this, this photograph. Um, but again, that's the, the famous image of taking the taking of Okinawa and Iwo Jima. So um, those were the last two islands that were necessary before Truman, who takes over as president. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, Truman must decide whether to do a land invasion, a kind of an amphibious invasion of Japan, or to drop the atomic bomb that was being built by the Manhattan Project discussed earlier. So um, the two conferences that are... Um, where they start planning for the end of the war and reconstruction of Europe and Japan are the Yalta and Potsdam conferences. So Yalta was before Germany had surrendered. It's February of 1945. You can see here Churchill, Roosevelt is still alive at this point, and Stalin. And both conferences are about discussing who will rebuild what, dividing up Europe um, into what England's going to be rebuilding, what the U.S. is going to be rebuilding, what uh, the Soviet Union will be rebuilding. So these two conferences are important because they essentially set up for the Cold War. That division that they are discussing will lead to that the Iron Curtain, the metaphorical Iron Curtain that will come during the Cold War, and that is established in these two conferences. The second conference to discuss... Um, Seen here, you've got again Churchill in the middle. You have Truman, um, because Roosevelt had passed away between Yalta and Potsdam um, from complications from his polio. So Truman has taken over at this point. Potsdam was in July of 1945. So at this point, um, Germany has surrendered. And so now they are just dealing with uh, the war against Japan. So Potsdam also about dividing up Europe, um, but they also issue at Potsdam a um, kind of an ultimatum to Japan saying, telling them to surrender. Uh, Japan does not accept that ultimatum. Um, again, Potsdam setting up for the Cold War. So we'll leave it there and in class we'll be debating um, whether or not to drop the atomic bomb and some of the considerations, pros and cons of doing a land invasion versus the dropping, versus the dropping of the atomic bomb. And that is it.